Good evening, everybody. I hope you're all well and comfortable. Looks more there than it does at home. Anyway, good e this evening we have John Leach, um, a member now for some time. Can't remember exactly how long, but he's going to talk to us tonight about when he photographs the moon. So, a little bit of an in introduction that he's uh, sent me. Only an A4 sheet for, well, obviously there's a lot to say about himself. So after leaving South Gold Secondary Modern School in June 1968, he worked as a research chemist of the United Coke and Chemicals at Orgreave. The company later became part of the British Steel Corporation and was known as the BSC Chemicals Division. During his time there, he worked on a variety of subject areas including paint research, the formulation of industrial type paints and emulsions used in coal tar byproducts, using, sorry, coal tar byproducts, biological effluent treatment, creating laboratory situation models of a biological treatment plant, specialized polyester products, a special polyester resin used to make sight glasses for use in high altitude aircraft. X-ray microscopy, I can't say it. Microscopy. Microscopy, including photography, and the analysis of asbestos types found throughout BSC companies, and analysis of electrode coatings produced for the steel industry. And, then, and after redundancy in 1981, he worked as a chemist for Union Carbide UK in Sheffield on a fixed uh, three and a half year contract. The post was centered around the quality assurance of graphite products used in the nuclear power sector. And during this period, he developed, com developed a computer program on the BBC Micro to carry out permeability and diffusivity calculations of nuclear grade graphite produced on site and abroad. Little did he know at the time that computing was to take over from chemistry. So from 1985 to 2011, he worked for Sheffield Polytechnic, later becoming Sheffield Hallam University, in the computer studies department as a senior technician, then as principal technician. During this period, he worked mainly in software engineering, networking, video conferencing. He also became an, an RVL, a regular visiting lecturer, teaching programming rapid prototyping and photo editing products to both undergraduate and postgraduate students. In 1999, he took time out from computing to study for a NIBOSH diploma in health and safety and became the school safety manager. Reconstru reconstructing, uh, sorry, resurrecting in 2006 meant move, moving back to it when I worked as a web technologist um, until taking early retirement and voluntary redundancy in 2011. So, as you probably gather, his interests include photography and has always been a lifelong in interest. Food and wine, music, long distance walks and climbing, in his early days, perhaps not so much now. He just thinks about it now. Absolutely. <laughs> Mycology, the study of fungi, and he's been a volunteer with the National Trust for 17 years, working initially at Clumber Park in Nottinghamshire and then Longshore in Derbyshire. This involves public fungi forays and various ecological surveys. So the Longshore survey team, which I was part of, were instrumental in stopping network rail, destroying an ancient woodland, rough wood in Derbyshire, and the developing of a major motorway service at the Smithy Wood near Thorpe, Esley, Thorpe Hesley area in Rotherham. So that's as much as we can tell you about him. And we're obviously up to date now. So please, everybody, put your hands together and welcome John Leach. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank, Thank you very you. much indeed. 
Okay, let's let's start by sharing the screen. And here we go. Right, good evening all. Really nice to be uh, giving you a, a talk on the eyes of the moon. Um, straight away, I, I've got to bring a few thanks and credits uh, in. Uh, one is the, the Mexican Swinton Astronomical Society. Who, uh, yeah, I've been with the think now for just over two years. I look forward every Thursday to, to join in uh, you guys. Uh, absolutely super. Um, in regards to the moon, uh, at particular, Peter Lloyd, from, uh, our friend from Doncaster Astronomical Society, has been a great asset to what I've been doing. Um, Peter's got his own website uh, with masses and masses of information. We communicate regularly, and um, I've learned so much from Peter. Roy Unson, I've worked with Roy, I've known him for uh, 30 odd years. I thank Roy for being Roy Gunson, one of the best. Um, absolutely, I mean, you don't have to buy me anything, Roy, that is, that is true. And, and my friend Ockintosh and uh, Three Wood Whiskey, which um, is very nice to come back to when you've, when you've had a cold night. Okay, um, I'll ask you the moon uh, and all its phases. Um, John, can I just interrupt you and tell you that we're looking at your editing screen for your PowerPoint, and we're not seeing we're not seeing them uh, the slides moving on. I can talk a little faster now. Um, okay, uh, what am I using? I, I'm using a, a DSLR camera, uh, various lenses, but one in particular. Uh, I'm using a thing called an extender, which is basically a, a two times a teleconverter, uh, a tripod rather than a handheld. Tripod is, is always better uh, to have. Uh, and I'm, I use a system of workflows uh, during uh, processing. Um, one of the main reason I'm using a, a, a camera and a tripod is it's so easy for me to actually take my gear out um, into the garden. It, I, I'm, I'm set up within a minute. Um, very often, uh, to get a good uh, clear sky in north of Alders, I walk 150 yards into a, a farmer's field. Uh, and it's a lot easier walking with a, a camera lens and a tripod than it is a, a mount and a, and, a, and a telescope. That's my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> uh, so basically, anybody can do this. Um, any type of DS, DS, DSLR camera will do, um, providing it's got a lens um, giving an image. However, uh, an image you know you really need requires a long focal lens lens uh, to get your, your better results and, and a better a better image. So let's let's compare them. Um, I hope people find this useful. Because a lot of people think, well, what lens do I need to actually photograph the moon? So these images. Um, that are created by using lenses from 100 millimeters right through to 600. And as you can see, that the, the, the longer the focal length, the, the bigger the image, the more data you've got to process. And obviously, the, the, the image is going to be a better quality. Um, I, I think I've observed of crop factors, and you know, a lot of people, astronomers, use uh, Canon cameras. Um, my, I used Nikon for, I don't know, 35 years, nearly 40, and then I, I moved entirely over to Canon, and I, I know a lot of uh, you guys using Canon. And I think Canon's got a, a crop factor, is it 1.6 or 1.5? Um, the Olympus, what I'm using, um, has a crop factor of two, it's a micro th four thirds. So basically, if I've got a 600mm lens on, uh, 
in actual fact, with a crop factor, we've got 1,200. So the size difference is quite, quite, quite a difference. And of course, the uh, I had the camera lenses and I had the Nikon lenses, and there they were nearly twice as much in price as what the Olympus was, and heavier. So basically, this is what I've got. It's um, an, o an OMD EM1 Mark III, which also has the um, star, uh, starly sky focus, auto focus. So you can basically point this uh, up to the sky, and it will actually focus spot on uh, on the stars. Um, no good for the moon, uh, purely for the stars, but um, it, it's just an added bonus you've got. Um, it's also got this um, a two-ton converter, so basically it's it's making this 300 mil lens into a 600 mil. Uh, so that's making that into a, a 600 mil f8, um, and it's all sat, sat on a, a Jitsu um, professional uh, tripod with a, a, a Jitsu two-way fluid f. So there's a close-up of the little teleconverter. They all, they all look the same, they all do the same thing. Um, on, the, on the lens itself, you, you've got a, a range of um, focusing uh, areas. So basically, if I'm looking at the moon, I'm, I'm basically looking between four meters um, and infinity, um, rather than asking it to uh, auto-focus you know, from uh, 1.4 meters uh, to infinity. Uh, Image stabilization, uh, I, I have turned off um, because it sat on a tripod. Uh, and of course, the, like most cameras at uh, this uh, time, it's got an articulated screen, so it, it makes viewing uh, quite easy. There's the, uh, the tripod end and the, and, and, and the tripod. Okay. The, the first question I had to uh, ask myself when I started doing this was, um, how am I going to capture images? In fact, when I first started, maybe three years ago, uh, I never thought about video at all. Um, all my images were, were done by either JPEG or, or RAW. Um, and then, you know, when I started to use um, video on the Olympus, I thought, well, um, it's silly not to use this when I, when I can get frame rates of 25 frames a second. Uh, and if you use one of their, their special modes, you can get up to 60, 60 frames a second. Um, I do a similar thing if I'm doing uh, bird photography, and I do eye, eye speed captures, where I'm, I'm capturing basically the 60 frames a second. Uh, so what, what I decided to do was to process uh, raw images uh, and 4K videos, just to see what, what sort of differences that we're getting. We both gave very, very good results, but the 4K video is, is it's easy. Um, processing the raw image, you have to do by a, 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 rather like a manual uh, fire in the visual, so where a, a video is, you, you click a button and, and away it goes, uh, and it stops whenever you want it to do. Um, in some circumstances, a capture of raw images is more suitable. If you've got a very small crescent moon, uh, a video doesn't often work very well. Um, basically, what, what the camera can't do, it loses track of focus. Um, and you basically have to go back to uh, capturing images raw files. Um, and of course, video captures produce larger files than, than raw. Uh, we'll, we'll look at that again uh, shortly. Both methods allow digital upscaling or drizzling. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with drizzle. I wasn't until about, oh, what, six months ago? Didn't know what it was. I thought it was something to do with nose dribbling. Or, yeah, I had no idea what it was. Um, it was only when I started to look at a uh, set of YouTube videos and I realized that, oh, this is quite an interesting um, uh, thing. The amount of data for one capture session uh, can be as large as 230 gigabytes. Uh, I actually did one the other, the other week, 
and it was uh, 320 gigabytes of data. That's one session with uh, eight um, periods during the day capturing, capturing the moon. Um, yeah, it says here, raw image capture preferable for present moons. Um, housekeeping, this housekeeping is essential. Um, it's very easy to fill a two terabyte hard disk uh, uh, within, within a week or so. Okay. Um, people who are photographers might look at this and, and think, that's a bit of a joke. <laughs> um, it's, it's very difficult, actually, uh, uh, between uh, the winter and summer, well, or, or throughout the year. The exposures um, are, are quite different. Um, in, in summer, I'm finding that the uh, when, when there's a full moon, I, I may go up to maybe a thousandth of a second, one thousandth from the fiftieth. Uh, and in 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 winter time, um, you know, maybe one sixty, one five hundred, one sixty five hundred. Really odd. I'm always using f eight, um, which is the it's almost a sweet spot of, of the. Um, of the lens, so it is basically giving me the, the best uh, quality. Uh, and of course, it, it's based on the, you know, what the atmospheric conditions are like and, uh, and so forth. But that's, it gives you a rough idea what, um, you know, what, what phase and what, what type of exposure you, you, you can start to look at. It's a ballpark sort of figure. So here we have a raw capture. Um, it's quite quite a nice capture, um, plenty of detail there. It's not being processed in any way. It's straight out of the, the the camera. And then the a 4K uh, video capture. I'll just go back. So uh, um, these are the same size. So obviously the, the 4K video capture gives you a, a bigger image. Um, what, once I've collected the the video uh, file or the uh, raw file, I, I have a, I have a workflow, and I'm sure I'm sure you guys have a, a workflow um, similar uh, to the way of the processing. Um, you know, the first thing I do is basically uh, put this thing through uh, PIP uh, to basically uh, process it and uh, align all the uh, all the images and, and take out the the, the, the poor ones. And then I do the alignment and stacking in, in auto stack it. Um, and then I, I, I'm a Photoshop user. I'm, I must say that I've been using Photoshop since day one. Uh, and I, I've taught and I've been on loads of Adobe courses. So I, it's one I'm, I'm happy with. Um, there are lots of free uh, editing software out there. I, I love it. It's very good. Uh, but Photoshop and I think Affinity or, or some of the new ones have a facility called that they have layers. You, think you can work with layers, and that's that's very important in in uh, astrophotography. Well, certainly for the moon. Um, I I do noise removal. Um, I know a lot of people use um, um, Registax, and you you use I think the wavelets. I've, I've used this. Um, I, I, I don't find it that good for my, my type of work. So I use a, a thing by a company called Topaz, who do a, a suite of programs. Uh, and we'll see examples of this just so we can see what, what it can do. Um, they also do a, a very fine sharpening uh, program. And they also do uh, an upscaling uh, program. Again, I'll, I'll give a example how, how I use these. And then everything goes back to Adobe Photoshop for a final edit. Um, I say both images, uh, uh, final images in, in TIFF and JPEG format. TIFF so I can, uh, I can store. Uh, I've always got the original video file and a JPEG to send to my friend Roy Gunton so I can put it in, in the gallery. Uh, and it, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a great backup system. I can highly recommend it. So if we can have more people sending uh, to the gallery, uh, you've got to go back up to it. Um, and then the next thing, removing uh, redundant files, labeling, and, and, and backing it. So 
pick. I think everybody's familiar with it with the speed. I'm not gonna uh, not gonna delve on it, but basically uh, there we have 14th of March, um, four video clips. Uh, and basically, I, I've just taken one into uh, into pick uh, to do the works. Um, taking uh, shots of the moon during the day, it's exactly the same. Um, straight into pick. Uh, don't, don't have any any problems at all. Um, what, what a super program! Um, again, you can see here that um, we've got um, yeah, all all ninety nine percent. But all very nice. Uh, and then, you know, whatever it is, the, the law go from being into auto static. What I tend to do, people have, have their own views on this. Um, I always uh, look around 100% of the frame percentage, uh, 80 and a 60. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I've got a thousand items here. So if it's about a thousand items, I'll use a under 16 or 40, uh, and I'll normally go for the, the 80, uh, give it the best, best result. Um, again, you see, uh, um, with, the, with the workflow, uh, I always, if I get any any quality less than 98.5, uh, I don't use it. Don't use it. So, okay, let's go on. Um, you see by the quality graph, it's um, it's quite a reasonable graph. Um, again, the same with the um, if we're looking at a, a crescent moon, um, these would be produced by um, not a video but by individual raw images. But again, we're pinned the ninety nine point. Uh, you know, I think this down to about two five there. So the first thing I do with, with the image once it's um, stacked uh, is to to crop it. So basically, I, I want a, a one to one square crop, and um, it's a standard crop. Uh, and you know, I was quite green at the time when I first started doing this. I didn't realise that the the moon uh, changed uh, size and shape and uh, I used to have a, a standard um, crop factor, and I used to use a, a workflow in, uh, in Photoshop where I'd take the image uh, and, and run it through this, um, this workflow and it would produce these beautiful um, cropped images. And then when I had a closer look, I found that I was missing the left side of the moon, the right side of the moon, all of the moon. <laughs> it doesn't work like that, does it? I, I know these things now, <laughs> thankfully. Um, so here we have a, um, yeah, a, a typical sort of cropped um, um, an initial post process in the image. Uh, and what we're looking at, what, what's important uh, for me uh, when I'm doing these, it is levels. Uh, and I'm looking at the RGB levels, and you can see from the graph that um, you know we've got lots of it, lots of space there. We we, we can you know close in on this Instagram on, on both sides. Um, the, the bottom output level, what we can actually do there, if we've got any burning, we can actually knock out uh, the lighter pixel. Um, and the, the, these are things that are, are very useful. You know, if you've got these uh, capabilities in your photo editing, uh, it, it makes things a lot easier. I, I'm sure, I think GIMP, I'm sure GIMP has a, a, a supervise. Um, one of the before any sharpening or whatever, what, what, what I tend to do is uh, I look at noise. Uh, you know, if, if, we, if we're looking at a, a moon, a crescent moon, um, it's usually taking an ISO maybe 800, maybe 1600. And, and noise is an issue. Uh, so what I do, I fly off from Photoshop and I, uh, I, I denoise them in this, um, in this piece of software. It has several modes of um, denoising. Um, this example shows severe noise. Um, I'm, I'm not how clear this will be. The image on the left, you should see um, next to the, on the, the, so the terminator, it is extreme grain. Can, can you see that? Can you, can you see that grain? 
And on the right hand side image, um, there's none. Does that, does that can, can people see that? Just point with your cursor what you're looking at, John. Right. What I'm looking at is this area. Right. Uh, and that should be that should be noisy. And then on the on the when it's been uh, put through severe noise and taken out, yeah. it should be almost black here. Okay. Um, Maybe you can't see it, you'll have to take my own word for it. Uh, but it's, it, it, it's quite a significant, um, um, you know, transformation. Um, once they've been into um, uh, denoise, I look at the, the sharpening process. Uh, and for the shop's got its own good sharpening. Uh, but this suite of software has an artificial intelligent based sharpen. Um, artificial words. But it, what, what they've basically done it, they've got thousands and thousands of images, and basically they use an algorithm that, that basically averages, you know, what type of sharpening, um, you know, you, you require. In this example, what I've used is what they call out of focus and very blurry. And again, you know, this is the, the blurry initial image, and here's the uh, ones that's been um, sharpened. Again, I'm not sure if you can see that. Um, it, yes, it, 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 the example shows it very, very well. Oh, good, 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 good. All right, if we, if we do again, um, here's another example, and I think this gives a better indication. You can see an original um, image, and then after applying um, the removing blur and adding a bit of blur and suppressing a little noise, and that shows quite a, a significant, um, you know, change. Uh, and if you look at here, we can see that this is a, a crop. This is two two hundred percent crop. Uh, and if you want to, you can you can look in at maybe four hundred and, and and see even better. Uh, but I don't work for the, this company. Um, no. <laughs> it's just that I do find the software very good for uh, for this type of work. Um, so it, it's you can see it's it it really is. If you look at the edge, uh, well, any part of the moon here, um, the detail starts to really come out when you apply uh, apply this uh, sharpening. Um, it, it, it brings me to the point where um, there's two types of sharpening or, or, or editing. Uh, and one's what I call aggressive, and the, the others are, are subtle, more subtle. Uh, and you often see people uh, and they'll, they'll place images like this on, on a website, or um, and, and to, to them in their eyes, that's how they see. It. That's that's what they want. That's what they're after. I I, I see no problem with this um, because that actually shows some detail. That this one, this is the one I prefer. The, the more subtle, it shows some detail that this one doesn't, and vice versa. Uh, and you know, it really comes down to a, a matter of personal choice. Um, you know, which which one you prefer. Okay, um, here, here again, we, we, we've got this, the same, we use the same factor here, where we've got this aggressive uh, type of um, edit. Still got lots and lots of detail uh, against the, the subtle uh, edit. And it really is, you know, it's how you, how you want it to be at the, the end of the day. So, um, you know, sharpening the image, when should you sharpen the image and how much sharpening? What are the implications? When, when you start to sharpen a, uh, an image, um, you have to be very careful. Most sharpeners, uh, like your default sharpen, is a destructive method. But basically, once you start to sharpen, Providing if you don't sort of save a copy before that, 
um, you'll never be able to go back. Um, and, and maybe I can, I can demonstrate this one on, on here. Um, do you have a, a, an image with um, no sharpening, uh, if we look at that, zoom? Um, it's, it's reasonable, but, you know, we haven't got any sharpening at, at all there. If we go back. And what I've got here, these are the um, these are the settings I'm using in Photoshop. So uh, uh, this is the uh, sort of uh, shallow sharpening, and this is the aggressive sharpening on the end. I think you see the, the spot of difference. Uh, so if we look, say, this one, 15115. Uh, we've got a nice, a nice balance of sharpening there. We go to uh, 300. This is it. What 300 is, that's the amount of uh, sharpening, the amount of sharpening that we want. Uh, and the, the 3.0, the, 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 the other figure, is the is the um, what is it? I forgot the name of it. Um, it's a radius. This is a radius for the number of pixels. So if we pick up three and have a look at that one, we can see what we get into that look about the uh, the aggressive shot. And if we if we sharpen using this method. And then we do some more editing, like I don't know, maybe maybe do some coloration or or, or maybe do some toning or, or curves. Um, we, we can't go back, not unless we we saved the, the, the one before. So you, you have to bear in mind when, when you when you do uh, sharpening, uh, do it in stages. If you look at this one here, four hundred. Um, some people, you know, I, I see pictures like this, some people will put pictures like this up, but, you know, you're losing a lot of detail, a lot of detail. If you look at here, this is the, this is the unsharp mask I'm using. Yeah, so we've got, we've got an amount of 400, and it's got a radius of four pixels. Um, but it's, yeah, it's got a little bit over. So, yeah, if we go back here to maybe zoom at 150, We've got, a, we've got an image we can carry out further editing with, and we can also adjust uh, some more subtle sharpening if, if, if we need. Okay. To drizzle or not to drizzle, that is a, that is a, um, yeah, it's almost embarrassing to think that, you know, up to four months ago, I, I had no idea what this was. Uh, so I started to look at it, variable pixel, in the reconstruction, uh, recently developed uh, for the Hubble telescope. Uh, and what it does, it, it creates an image that is larger than the image in the stack or interpolates between pixels to ensure it can use to find detail in edges. And it's, you know, it's the same, it's the same as, as upscale, image upscaling, um, I think. <laughs> so let's, let's, let's have a look at this. Um, it can produce good quality images. No, there's no two ways around it. It uses a lot of disk space. Um, the, the image, you know, it, it, if you've got a, a, a video clip and you're producing 2,000 images, 2,000 tips, those tips are going to be, instead of 10 megabytes, they're going to be uh, 8 to 200. Um, you need a fast CPU and plenty of RAM. I've got uh, 32 mega RAM in one uh, and 64 in another. And I still I still find it slow. Um, but let's have a look at this. This is the image created um, setting the drizzle factor times three in auto stack it. This is the no drizzle. That's quite a significant upscale. Um, you know, I mean, this this was designed uh, for undersampled images, uh, and 
obviously you, you'll get you'll get this with each star stuff and whatever. And I was quite surprised w w with the moon that it, it worked so well. Uh, and I, I've not seen many instances where people are actually using these on YouTube for, for the moon. But it's that is significant. Um, and, and that gives you a lot of data. So um, I think I've got a, a slide here that um, it, it gives you an idea of what, what I've done here. I've took the pixels out and I, I, I actually, actually asked it to look at, tell me what the size is. Uh, in inches, it's 78 inches <laughs> by 78 inches. And it's, um, well, there's the dimension. So you've got 5,624 pixels square. You've got an image size of 181 megabytes. It's huge, it's huge. Um, Peter will know uh, some of the things I do to cheat. What I do is I resample. What I do occasionally, what I do, I'll change the resolution from 72, uh, which is the default when you've done your, uh, your, your editing. And I'll, I'll, I'll stick that back up to um, maybe 150, maybe 300. And, and, and I get an incredible large image um, that allows us to do far more editing. Um, I can't remember what this is, <laughs> this on the moon. Um, but this, um, what, what I've done here, I've taken this. Uh, this has been, um, this is set drizzle. This was on, on uh, three. Uh, and what I've done here, I zoomed in. Uh, and this is at quite a level. Um, uh, and, and what I've got here is the, I'm showing you the input levels. So I've, I've got a bit of scope here to actually bring this down and, uh, and make this image a, a little bit better. So look at the next one, I'm getting dark, it's getting darker here. Um, and then what I can do, I can then take that, because once you start using this, you will get, you will get these horrible sharp edges We've all seen them, you know. Um, it, it reminds me of fungus. This one. So what you can do now, you can you go to the denoise and you apply denoise. Um, several modes. The one that I use a lot is this called low not uh, low light, but you can see the difference it makes to the image. Can, can you see that, uh, Paul? Is, is that? I personally can't. You yeah, but can't. It's taking out the sharpness of the edges. Uh, is it? Right. What, I can see it, John. You, you can see it, Peter. Good, good. Yes, yes. The, um, the, the, the sharpness of the black area on the left is much sharper edge than it is on the right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and of course, it, 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 it's too sharp. So you need this denoise just basically to smooth it uh, a little bit. Okay, let's let's move, move that on. Um, John, John, is it equivalent to a Gaussian blur? Uh, no, no, it's no, it's not Peter. Oh, it's not. Okay. No, no. Um, so that, um, there's another example. It's probably not as good. The thing I want to uh, show on this slide is. Um, this is going back to, um, um, this is a thing called Gigapixel L. And this is their uh, upscaling software. So what I've done, I've actually taken uh, that image previously and I've, I've put it into this uh, um, upscaling and I use a, one of their modes called Art and Computer Graphics. If I use um, standard or anything with lines in it or lower resolution, it doesn't work. But they've got a, they've got one here called Art and Computer Graphics, and it's an absolute bee's knees in in upscaling, even when you've already upscaled. So this is that creator. This is the creator we just be looking at. 
and you can see how it's it's upscaled up to a an incredible um, magnification. Um, I'll just turn my laptop. Um, just to give you an idea, what I've got here is um, I've got a, a, a drizzle um, file uh, and just a normal uh, TIFF file. And you see the difference. We, we've got um, 9.78 megabytes uh, on normal file. And on a, a drizzle file, we've got uh, almost 90. So, you know, you can see there's a huge difference. Uh, and, and of course, you know, I, I, you know sometimes you, you're fortunate doing it there and you might be able to get out several times before the afternoon. Some people have got lives. So <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, um, you can look there, there's 11,500 files. There's only the 60 gigabytes um, of data, which is colossal. Um, so, you know, once you've got your, um, you, 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 um, you finish files, you know, and you start to clean up. So after cleaning up, what it's done is reduce that that day, if you like, goes far to 13.4 gigabytes, which is still um, a substantial amount, but it's it's a lot smaller. And of course, in there, it will contain the original video clip, which is probably about I don't know, maybe maybe 300 megabytes, uh, and it's will have the, the 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 file created by Autostatia. So basically, I can go back to any any image and re-edit it. Um, and what I, what I do is um, we, we're now in Surveyor Pro. Um, so these are the um, what I do. Once I've done these modifications and got rid of all the uh, uh, all, all the waste files and, and redundant files, I then create these. Um, these directories with a modified uh, label on. Uh, and you can see I'm, at the moment, I'm, I'm, I'm up to date till the 9th of April. So these these ones here have to be uh, at some point edit, uh, well, modified or, or the redundant files taken out. I, I, think, um, I think Tony, I think last week, or asked me, how I do me um, sort of, um, you know, I'll I catalog up my, my files. And this is it, I, 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 I'm an old boys school, uh, and this is how I do all my, uh, all my cataloging. So, uh, drizzle conclusions. You can draw your own conclusions on using drizzle, but I think it's pretty cool. Uh, it'll be interesting to find out afterwards um, if other people use it. Uh, of course, um, we, we can photograph during the day at the moon. Um, it's it's fine. Uh, I, I've had some good results. I've had some bad ones. I mean, it, it all depends uh, whereabouts in the sky that the sun is. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's possible to do it. Um, we take a look at this one, um, and then maybe this one. See that. It's the same image of the moon. That's the original. Uh, that's the original one, uh, and I, I'll put it on a, a different, uh, different sky. So uh, hands up. I don't cheat a little bit sometimes. <laughs> um, but it, what's the difference? Um, None at all. Uh, the process is slightly different. You know, uh, when you photograph and you're in the day, the contrast is uh, it, it's not very good. It's, it, it, it's, it's quite low. Um, you have a little bit more work. Um, a lot of um, a lot of cameras have, have a, a, a thing where you can shoot in mono, uh, and software you can convert to grayscale. Um, what I have is a process by 
it, it you convert to black or white but under your say so. In other words, you actually tell it um, if if you want the magenta moving out the way, if you want the blue moving out the way, and leave the others there. In that way, what you've done is you've got rid of this cast. You've got rid of this cast. You, you've got this cast, but you're still working with an RGB image. Uh, and that can be beneficial when you're further editing. And you've got more control with an RGB image than you have a grayscale. Look, imaging, we, 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 you know, we've all got it. I, I, I've got quite a few of these, but I, I thought I'd just speak one in. Um, you know, photograph in the moon, and sometimes you get lucky and uh, you get some of the bombing and you get, a, you get a nice image. Um, I've got to I've got to bring in some others that when when to throw in the towel if you like when to when, when should they stop editing uh, turn your computer off get a drink do, do something and it's when you get um, when you this is about the limit you know with all of these images uh, and you get this beautiful red fringe on the on the edges here and to take it out it, it plays havoc. Um, it's not simple editing. Um, you've got to do a little bit more. And, and that's about the limit of where you, you're going to get. Not much detail. Um, so it's a record, but that's, that's all it is. Um, yeah, sometimes we, we don't get a chance. We, 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 we're trying to get the moon uh, between the cloud. Um, it's just a... It's just one of those things. We, we um, just take a shot and, and be happy with it. You know, you, you can see you've got uh, artifacts here, and you know, it's, um, all this is very draining. Even if you try uh, taking the noise out, it will it, it, it wouldn't work. Um, we've had these. I'm sure Pete's had one or two of these where you get this, this beautiful it clouds. So you're trying to take the photograph of the moon from the clouds. Um, you know, uh, I've, I must admit I've got lots of these. When I first started doing them, I used to uh, photograph it, Peter, and I, um, uh, when it was in white cloud, I thought that was a good opportunity to take the moon. <laughs> um, it's not a cross, uh, and you, you, you learn by your mistakes. But, but the useful mistakes. Um, I think we can all remember this one. Um, I can't remember how I did this. And I, I don't think Roy was too pleased when I, when I sent him this one. I don't, I don't think he even showed it. But, it, um, but it, you know, if anything, uh, if, if you want an example of aggressive editing, then I think this, uh, this shows it. Um, but, you know, how do you, you know, a lot of people ask, how do you color the moon? Uh, and, and, and here's an example where it's there's the original moon. Um, you can see little bits of um, bits of color, uh, and then it, in in software like Photoshop, um, it is so easy to to do. Um, and this this takes about two minutes. Um, and you know, but sometimes, sometimes it works better than others. It all depends. It, it's terrible for the weak credit. You can't do treasures. It, it, it ain't going to work that way. But when it, when you got a fair size uh, chunk, uh, uh, then then, then he, 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 he can get a good picture. Um, the important thing is when you when you want to recall a picture, is that you take the original image, and what you do, you apply. A small amount of sharpening, but more importantly, you take out as much noise as you possibly can. Um, because what will happen is when, when you start to apply color, and color is done through a, um, a series of um, basically du duplicated layers that contain a, a level of concentration. 
So basically, you've got a concentration of colour or, or of your bead. And what you're doing, you, you, it's like a, you apply a coat of paint and then you apply another coat and it's getting darker and darker. Uh, uh, and if you've, got a, if you've got a noisy moon to start with, um, it'll, this will be very, very blotchy. Because once you start to create this, you, what you've created is a, a false um, contrast. You see this, this is far more contrasted than, than these. So you, you have to start this compromise between sharpness and, and especially noise there to achieve this. Um, so how do I colour the moon? Um, to do it properly, um, you'll need something like Photoshop. Or you'll need something that allows you to uh, create layers um, and alter things like the saturation level, uh, levels uh, and curves. And they're the important parts, if you like, to, in order to do it. You can, of course, um, you know, when you're in these editing, the piece of editing stuff, you can start doing daft things. This is like a, this is like a, a, a watercolor version, which has also been colorized. Um, I've actually tried to achieve this uh, using my normal technique, and I can't. It's infuriating. But because of this this um, watercolor thing, it's it's done it. It, it produces these beautiful areas. Um, you know, and we can, we, we, we can recognize, but I can't at the moment. I, I, one minute, I'll, I'll, I'll send an image off to Roy, hopefully, and he can see it because I, I, I'll have done it. But, you know, got to be done. So, um, I don't know if uh, people on YouTube, um, one of the guys, one of my friends on YouTube is a guy called Robin Bong. Uh, he does lots of videos. Uh, and when he starts from, he'll start one of his YouTubes uh, and he'll, he'll describe what he's doing and then he'll say, let's do this. And he's a brilliant guy. Now, what I've done here, and you'll have to excuse me, Paul, if this doesn't work, uh, I've, I've done a macro so that when I press this, it should go into 40 slot. Now, if it doesn't, I'm going to have to stop sharing screens and do it manually. Let's see if it does it. Are you still with us, everyone? We are. Is it opening for the shop? Not at the moment. Well, something happened, but uh, it's the same right. picture, John. Right. Can you see for the shop? No. No. <laughs> right. What I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to stop sharing uh, and open for the shop. Uh, uh, so if you just talk amongst yourselves, just brief, I'll just do this. You should be able to see my Photoshop screen. Yes. yes. In the moon. Yes? Yes. Super. Right. Um, let me move this. Um, what I've got here is a, a picture of the moon. <laughs> uh, we all know and love. Um, and I'm in Photoshop now. And what I'm going to do is do a simple coloration using uh, uh, layers. So what, what, what I've got down here, I, I mean, I'll, I'll just go through with this. I'm basically going to do a new a saturation layer. Um, you can see it's there. So that's, that's his original uh, image. And this is a, a, a new, um, a new layer. And what I'm going to do is to click on that. Come on. Let me move it over there. Oh dear. Oh dear.
Right, you should be able to see now the um, adjustments, yeah, and the, the layers. And what I'm going to do is to move this saturation to the right. And can you see the coloration coming on? Yeah. Right, I'll, I'll, I'll take you to 40, right? And then I'll close it. And then I'll go over here. And what I'm going to do is duplicate that layer. In other words, it's going to add another layer with that bit of color. Can you see what it's done? Yeah. Can you see the color coming up? Yes. And that is how easy it is in Photoshop. It is easy when you can find your control. <laughs> It's this way. I couldn't believe it. The, the gallery people were, were, were in front of the... Uh, <laughs> and, and, oh, wow, I mean, what embarrassing. And then what you can do with this then is to uh, go back into curves. Uh, or, or, and you can see there's nothing there. Uh, because one thing that everybody forgets when they start doing this, you, what you've got here is several layers. So what you have to do is to uh, merge the, the layers or flatten the image. So for flatten the image, uh, and then what I can do is go into curves and we can start, we can start doing things with it. With this. And really you can play with this as, as long as you wish. Uh, and can you, can you see, uh, I mentioned noise and sharpness, you can see it seems to do quite a bit of noise uh, into that image. Um, I'm not going to fly off into uh, the other program because I think that will just uh, mess it up. But what I'll do, I'll, if I go into noise in here and reduce noise, um, I mean, this. Photoshop's not got the best noise uh, reduction. Um, I don't know if you can see the difference there. But that's, that is basically how you colorize the, the moon. Um, can, can everybody see it? Is that, does it look colorful? It is a very <laughs> colorful fine. image. Yeah, good, good. Uh, well, I'm not going to go back into um, the PowerPoint because I think I will lose. Um, let me get rid of that. Uh, what I'm going to do, Paul, is I'm going to stop the share and, uh, and come back to you. I thank you very much indeed. <laughs> I'm sorry about the glitches, but I hope you found it uh, useful. <laughs> As of always, listening to you, John, is a delight, and we always learn something. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much. So we're going to go straight to questions. I've got, uh, can somebody deal with the lights, please? Uh, I've got a group of people down here. Uh, digital hands for you guys who are uh, joining us from afar. Uh, so questions, please. Anybody got any questions? <laughs> Go there, John. What's your question? Uh, you were talking about aggression with uh, sharpening. Yeah. And uh, you you were defining it with two parameters, three parameters. I yeah. saw we, we'd gone onto the software, there were three parameters. The smaller one of the numbers was the radius in pixels. Yeah. That it was applied in pixels. Yeah. What's the first number? The first one is the amount of um, um, sharpening. And that's on a scale from? Um, it, it goes, I think, one, one to 400, 450. OK. But, but the thing is, Paul, what, what you can do is you, you, you can take it, say, 350, uh, apply it, and then you go back to sharpening, and you start again. Yeah, um, just undo. Yeah. Okay, uh, Bill, Bill from Cleethorpes. 
Yes, very interesting talk. Very, very impressive uh, to, to see how you do these things, as well as seeing the final results. So thank you for that. Uh, I wondered if you could just say a little bit more about the well, the computers that you use in terms of, you've said, you know, you need fast processors and, and big hard disks and so on. Um, but presumably your monitor is very important as well. For Yes, uh, yes, well, uh, thanks for the thanks. Uh, I, I tend to use um, Dell monitors. Um, I used to use them at the three either university that I, I would have loved to have brought home with me, uh, but I couldn't, I, I couldn't even wonder it. Um, yes, um, not only a good monitor, though, not, not, not that dear, you know, you, you know, you get them. Eight hundred thousand pound. Um, I think mine are about maybe two hundred pound. Uh, I think the important thing is the the calibration uh, uh, and making sure that you, you you keep looking at the calibration to make sure that the uh, the screen is calibrated. And what I, I use a thing called Spider. Uh, I've used one or two different things. But what I do, I, I combine it with the uh, printing uh, calibration. Uh, and the and the Photoshop itself, so there'll be profiles in, in Photoshop um, to do that. But you know, for the moon, um, it's it's not a big issue at all. Um, most of my, you know, if I'm doing a wedding, say, or or, or I'm doing uh, uh, people's skin then I'll then I'll I really want a, a, a fine calibration. But for the moon, it's so you know. Everybody's got their own uh, taste and view on how the moon should look, or, or even the sun, or, or anything. Um, you look at these the sky objects, and everybody's got their own interpretation. So it's not it's not that it's not that important. I wouldn't advise anybody to go out and buy a, uh, an expensive monitor, but I would I would advise on anybody doing this process to to look at the memory they've got and uh, and the process of like. Mine, mine's, I think my machine's probably about five or six years old, but I do make my own, so they are, they are pretty good. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, uh, Mick Nichols. Hi, John. Hi, uh, Mick. You said on uh, one of your slides that... Um, the crop sensor was better for uh, crescent moons. I was just wondering what's the reason for that? Uh, purely down to focusing, mate. Um, if, I, if I were using the video um, on, a, on a crescent moon, what would happen is um, as the moon moved, I would lose focus. Uh, we're, we're on a, you know, a, a bigger moon. Um, that was an issue. <clears throat> so um, that, that, that's purely that. I mean, I could solve it. I could basically put a, a tracker on, but that defeats the object of, of travelling light if I have to go to a farm field. But, yeah, purely down to that, Mick. No worries. Okay, thank you, Mick. Any questions? Any more questions from anybody well, out there? I've got a question, but we'll have to set amazed how much detail you can get out of teleport door lens, not a telescope. It's impressive. Sorry, what, what was that? <laughs> I'm impressed. I'm impressed on how much you can get out of a teleport door lens with a telescope. You notice I didn't put a single shot of a bird or a fungus on. <laughs> I could see you shaking at the effort. You're going to be dangerous if you ever use a telescope on the moon, John. You do <laughs> realise that. Well, uh, well, ladies and gents, I think we've worked John hard enough. I think he looks slightly traumatised, actually, after this <laughs> evening's event. So can we give John Leach a big next for Swinton Astronomical Society? Thank you for an excellent talk. Thank you, John. You're very welcome. Very welcome.